Hey, how you doing? It's Jay Julio Vela here for Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association, Reasonable Doubt. It is a very, very special program today where we have one of my friends, a mentor, and this year, Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association Mentor of the Year recipient, Eric Davis. Eric, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Julio. It's good to be here. Thank you for having me. You know, as as a young lawyer, I remember you going to the courthouse, and there was a, there was a rumor early on where Eric Davis had over a thousand dismissals. Is that true? I don't really know how many dismissals I have. There was a time when I kept count, but I stopped keeping count right now. There was a time I used to do it because it was great for advertisement when I was in private practice. But since I've joined the public defender's office, I don't really even keep count of how many dismissals I, I have. Eric Davis is the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association Mentor of the Year. Before we continue, uh, I di let, allow me to introduce first and foremost fellow host Justin Harris. How are you doing, Justin? I'm doing great. All I heard was Eric says he can't keep track of how many dismissals he gets. Well, he can't keep track of how many lives that he saves and changes. It's That's issue. true. And we would be remiss if we did not mention Mark Pirtle in the booth and with Houston Media Source. How you doing, sir? Mark, Mark staying silent so they can't see him. Oh, he's there. Well, with the Harris County Criminal Lords Association Mentor of the Year, Eric Davis. Eric, how you doing, man? I'm doing good. I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. This is these are some uh, unprecedented times that we're living through right now. And so uh, you, you, you've got to be careful. And I've been being careful, spending time with family. I've grown co closer to my family. Um, it's been good. Let me ask you something. You talk about unprecedented times. I think that I think that is a twofold kind of deal. The first thing is, is obviously COVID. The second thing is, is obviously the issue, the uh, processions and protests of police brutality. Um, let's talk about, uh, what do you want to talk about first? You want to go COVID? Let's talk, or, or is it a mismatch of both? Oh, man, I think all of it is something, you know. Truth be told, uh, everything with the protests is, is, is interesting. Um, you know, I, I was talking to some people the other day. And they were asking me, they were telling me, they said, you know, the system is broken. We got to do something to try to fix the system. And, and, and of course, being a defense lawyer, I, I told them, I said, well, you know, the history of a thing will tell you whether or not a thing is doing what a thing is supposed to do. And the history of, of law enforcement in, in America is it, it's working the way it's supposed to work. It's functioning the way it's supposed to function. In there particular, was a there was a, a sign that said the system isn't broken. That's the way it was designed. Is that what you're talking about? Absolutely. But even more so, right? The history of local law enforcement in the South originates in a very uh, unique way. Uh, constables' offices, a long time ago, they were called, quote, unquote, Indian constables when they were established. Um, the constables were established to sort of, quote, unquote, protect settlers from Native Americans or Indians, and so they were called Indian constables. Most local law enforcement agencies in the South originated from slave patrols. And then, uh, in addition, there was something called night watches. There were people who would be out at night watching to see if any slaves had been had escaped. And those, those loose militias uh, later on formed police agencies. And this isn't just some black dude telling you this. You look at different police organizations when they track their own history. That's what they'll tell you the history is. The origin of these organizations started as slave patrols, started as um, uh, Indian constables. They started as organizations that were designed to oppress people, designed to control poor, and at that time, enslaved people. And some were developed through uh, black codes, the creation of black codes and so forth. And this isn't just me telling you this. If you go to some police organizations, some paternal, they will tell you that. You can, you can Google it, right? You can Google origins of the of police agencies, and you will find it on some sites that are um, police agency sites, and they'll list that as their history. So if the history has been to uh, uh, oppress people of color, why are we surprised when, it, when it's happening now? 
If the history and origins of the organizations were designed to do that, why would we expect something different now? And and so I, you know, that's sort of my view on that. Um, is that yeah, yeah, definitely. It's not um, broken. It's working the way it was designed to work. How you were elected mentor of the year? What is what are the number one? How'd you feel when you got that award? And congratulations, Eric Davis, the mentor of the year for Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association. What was your feelings behind it? And and what and what are your thoughts going forward? Talk to us about it. How did Real you feel talk, when you got the award? Real talk, Julio was humbling, man. It was really humbling, you know, because I'll be honest with you. I, I felt like I got a reward award for doing my job, uh, for doing what I'm I supposed agree. to be doing, basically. I felt like I got an award for doing what I'm supposed to be doing, and so so it was humbling. It really was. Well, I, I wasn't expecting it. Um, I didn't didn't think it was. Uh, I didn't think what I was doing was was worthy of an award because it's what what I'm what lawyers we're supposed to do this. We are supposed to help out lawyers, help their clients as criminal defense lawyers. Um, um, you, you caught me off guard when you asked me about those dismissals, and I don't want to come across as being hardy. I just don't keep track of dismissals. And, and I typically don't keep track of people I help either. If somebody calls me, um, I, I gave a talk uh, in, in New Orleans some years ago, and I get calls every now and then from lawyers. And I don't keep track of the lawyers that call, but I get a lot of them. And we sit and talk uh, about stuff associated with their cases. And I tell you, when they call me back and tell me about the results and how they were helped, I get gratification. Um, when, when they're in the newspapers or whatever because of something I did to help them, I get gratification. When somebody is helped um, with me taking a few minutes of time uh, to try to help them out, I feel good about that. And I think that's what we're supposed to be doing. As lawyers, we have been given so much, so much. We have so many benefits to being an attorney. Um, there are only, and this, this might sound corny, but there are only one group of people who can represent other people. Only one group of people who can stop other people from going to prison, and those are criminal defense lawyers. We're in a select group, and we are the only people who can actually represent and, and stop people from losing their freedom. And, uh, and I, I take it as a privilege that I can help somebody else in, in the calling that we have. I, where, I, I do you, a privilege. where do you draw your strength and, and ideas from mentoring young people? Mentor new, new lawyers. I, I know that uh, you are, I, I, I've looked up to you and I, quite frankly, have stolen your motions and things. I've looked you up and I, I, I take your stuff and I file, I refile it. I just put my name on it. Uh, where has I do that too. I have yeah, I mean, to done that. Where I tried to put a closing argument either. Well, talk to, talk to us about where that you decided to, you could have taken the high road, and I, I say the high road, and I mean ivory tower road, and not helped any, anyone else. What, what, what makes you uh, want to give back and mentor younger lawyers like myself growing up uh, in your practice? You know, what's interesting, man, what about the, the guy that, that's, uh, that, that has a family, um, and he's got kids, and he's got a job, and he's driving home one night, and, and the police get behind him, and they pull him over, and they search the car. And he, he, some of his coworkers have been in the car, and they search the car, and they look in the back seat, and they find a little rock of cocaine. And they arrest him and take him to jail and charge him with a case. What about that guy who gets the lawyer who comes to him, doesn't look at an offense report, um, doesn't talk to any witnesses, don't, doesn't really ask him what happens, and tells them, he said, look, man, they offer you a deferred adjudication. You need to take this deferred. They offer you a deferred. You need to take the deferred. What about that guy? And um, when I think about people uh, who are in a tough spot, I can't represent everybody. Where, and, where do you draw the strength to tell that guy to not take that deferred and to push forward? Well, wh because what I was going to say that, That's is, a game. That, that is a huge deal. And I think that is the line where some lawyers say take the deal, other law other lawyers say no. Uh, where does that strength come from for you? Well, I mean, you know, from a personal standpoint, I, I, I draw strength from God. Um, from a personal standpoint, I draw. I, I think I have to ultimately the things I do, I'm accountable to God. That's for me and from a personal level. Uh, from when did a, you from a professional level, I, I think I, I, I have been poured into. In other words, people are poured into me. 
And I have family members who, who are in the penitentiary. I've got family members in the penitentiary. I got family members who got a raw deal from the criminal justice system, um, who had lawyers who, who lay down on them, um, and, and some went to the penitentiary. I have I've experienced that. And so so it's not something that's gonna happen on my watch. I don't plan on laying down on any of my clients. But but more so, you ask about where do I draw the strength to give back to other lawyers? And, and I draw that strength because I can't represent everybody. And 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 Craig Washington can't represent everybody. Tyrone Macri can't represent everybody. You know, Brian Weiss, those guys, they can't represent everybody. Everybody can't have top shelf lawyers. Um, and so what we have to do as lawyers is we've got to multiply. As lawyers who are committed to fighting for our clients, we've got to multiply, create more lawyers who are committed to fighting. And if we do that, then the guy who's got a family who stopped and he gets a court appointed lawyer, he has a chance. If we turn our back on lawyers who are in the trenches, lawyers who are, who are doing that for a living, who are eking out a living, some, some lawyers are, doing court appointments. Some people even start in practices that way. If we turn our backs and not support them, then we're dooming a, a lot of poor people who can't afford a lawyer. So I think our indigent system has to be improved. And our indigent system has to make it such that the person who is poor gets the representation that they would get if they had the money to hire Rusty Hart. That's my view. I think Eric, Eric, like Eric Davis, like mentor of the year, Harris County Criminal Lords Association. We want to mention that our Facebook feed is, is, is it might be down and I'm not able to take the questions. Uh, and so if anybody's out there, they can... Um, either text me or Justin or, or Eric Davis for any questions or thoughts. I'd love for people to share their Eric Davis moments. I remember my Eric Davis moment is going well, into Jay, a closing argument. And I JV, saw I, Eric. Uh-huh. No, go ahead. And I, I walked in there and I saw Eric giving this closing argument. I mean, this must have been eight or nine years ago, and I think it was before he was with the public defender's office. In fact, I know it was. And I thought to myself, this guy has some guts because he was saying things and doing things that um, that you only saw in movies and that um, he may you may not want to say if you wanted to be a part of the establishment system. What uh, you tell me, Eric, that you drew from God to to get your strength. But what was the impetus for you to become a lawyer and decide that you're going to do criminal defense? Where was oh, that? Man. Where were you? Oh, man, you want to hear that? Can we, can, can we back up a little bit yeah, before, you, before you get into that, Eric? How long have you been practicing? You said you were in private practice before. Did you do any other kind of work before you started doing criminal defense? And then what, then like what you started said. my career. I started my career as a prosecutor, actually. I was a prosecutor, um, started my career from 94 to 97. I was a prosecutor. Then in Where? 90, I was a prosecutor in Florida, actually in North oh, really? Florida. <laughs> yes. And in, in Jacksonville. North Florida? Florida? In Jacksonville. Jacksonville? Florida. Okay. Yeah. Jacksonville. So you remember all that stuff with Trayvon Martin and um, George Zimmerman? The lawyers that tried that case, I, I worked in the same office with them, knew them. Uh, you know, <laughs> and Angela Corey, who was a prosecutor at the time, was my supervisor. Way back when, in 1994. Um, from 94 to 97, I was a prosecutor. I moved to Florida with my wife, had an opportunity to work at the U.S. Attorney's Office, and I had an opportunity to work at the Harris County District Attorney's Office. Passed on both of them. Was, did not want to prosecute. Did not want to do it. So I, I did some corporate work uh, for about a year and a half, and then I started a small practice, um, did criminal defense, and did civil rights work. That's where, where my passion was. I did civil rights work, started off doing uh, employment discrimination, religious discrimination, doing different types of discrimination cases. I tried my first trial as a, as a, law, as a lawyer, that wasn't, not as a prosecutor, was in front of Judge David Hittner. I did a religious discrimination case. Really? Got, got past summary judgment, tried it in front of Judge Hittner, got a verdict, got a half million dollar verdict, um, and then... Um, he saw me and appointed me. From that trial, he appointed me on a federal drug conspiracy case. Had never done a drug conspiracy case before. Didn't wow. know what I was doing. You know, I was so how did the conversation go, Judge? You get done with your trial, you get your verdict and your judgment, and, the, and then the judge calls you up or calls you into chambers? and Pretty much. Just like, he, he called me he up. Said, he said, I got something I you want you to help us with. He said, I got something I want you to help us with. We have something you want to help us okay. with. And then Ellen, I don't know if you know Ellen Alexander. 
but Ellen Alexander uh, um, kind of gave me the information and they got me started. I went to visit the guy in jail and I'll never forget that. Um, <coughs> talking to him, sitting down, getting to know him. And then we had a defense counsel meeting because all the defense counsel was like, hey, you just coming on the case. Trial is in two and a half weeks. You know, trial is in two and a half weeks. So we're going to get a continuance out of this thing. And, and I said, well, yeah, you know, I'll file a continuance. So we do. We did a motion for continuance and we had a big hearing because Judge Hittner brought us all to court. And, uh, and he, he asked me, he says, can you get ready? Can you get ready? Can you be ready? If you had to clear everything, can you be ready? I said, of course, I can be ready. And he said, denied. Motion denied. <laughs> so, so, uh, <laughs> thanks, for that, thanks for that favor I did for you, Judge. Yeah, so all the lawyers were like, man, what are we going to do? And we were all sitting around. We were all sitting around. I was like, oh, I got to figure out how to try this case. And then one of the defendants said, call Robert Jones. Y'all need to call Robert Jones. Call Robert Jones. And I heard Robert Jones' name before, but I didn't really know him like that. You know, I, I didn't know him that well. So I, I ended up calling Robert Jones, who's a criminal defense lawyer. Y'all may know Robert Jones, old African-American gentleman. I know the name. Yes, sir. So he did a lot of federal cases, a lot of federal work back then. Still does. And so I called Robert Jones. And um, Robert Jones didn't know me from Adam. And, and he stopped everything and sat me down on the phone. He probably talked to me for about two or three hours on the phone, dropped everything, didn't know me, and then walked me through everything I need to do to defend the case um, in two or three hours on the phone. And, uh, and I was able to take that and use that to fight in that case. Uh, I'd love to say we got the verdict, but it was, uh, it was a drug conspiracy. My client was on tape, um, you know, and it was, it was that kind of situation. It was a huge crack case, but, but we put up a real serious fight and um, took it from pillar to post in that case. Do so, you remember Robert, Robert yeah. Jones? Sorry, JV. You're mentor of the year. Um, you're like, I'm assuming you're like me. There's no way I know anything from buttoning my shirt to getting up in the morning that somebody else didn't teach me. Who are some of the mentors that, that you still draw on? Not Maybe not, maybe don't talk to anymore. Um, maybe you don't need to go to them for advice, but you still remember some of the things that they did for you. Oh, man, a lot of people pour it into me. I, I definitely would say Robert Jones. Um, I also say Tyrone Moncrief. Tyrone Moncrief yes, poured into me, gave me direction, gave me guidance. Um, you know, would just, just come alongside me and give me advice. He got me. I, I do a lot of speaking at CLEs. Now I'm speaking at a national level on CLE. The very first time I ever spoke at a CLE was at Tyrone Moncrief's urging and his invitation. And so he got me into speaking at CLEs. And Alex Bunnen? I'd say my boss, Alex Bunnan, is, is a mentor. He gives me a lot of guidance right now in the current position I'm in. Um, I don't always listen to him, but I listen to him most of the time because he has real good advice. <laughs> um, you know, and I got to listen to him because he's my boss, too. But, but for the most part, um, he, he's one. Um, I, I would also say that Jackie Carpenter, you guys know Jackie Carpenter? Of course. She would list me as a mentor, but I'll tell you, I've learned a lot from Jackie Carpenter. More Likewise. than I'm willing to admit. Um, and so, uh, can y'all erase that? Can you erase that? I didn't mean to say that. I'll check. I'll take that out. <laughs> we, could, we could fix that on the edit. We can just put the part where you said Jackie probably would list you as a mentor of hers. So Sounds good. That. And then, then, then Jerry Spence is also, uh, has been a mentor. Um, Jerry Spence. Uh, Did I've you do trial lawyer college? Yes. I'm, I'm a member of the, I'm a graduate of the trial lawyers college. I've been on staff at the trial lawyers college since, um, 2005, I think. Wow. And, and I learned a lot from Jerry Spence over the years, um, early on more so, but he's gotten older now, so we don't see him very much, but I learned a lot uh, from Spence. You know, people, people talk a lot about the uh, trial lawyers college, um, and I, I just don't know if I, like, for example, myself, I don't know if I can take 30 days off. People say it's completely, I mean, but not 30 days. Is it 30 days or, or the, the, the three, weeks, three months? Or the three weeks. Right. Three weeks. Three weeks. Off, three weeks. Um, you think it's worth it? Yes. When I went, it was a little longer than three weeks. Back. Now it's three weeks. But when I went, I think it was a little bit longer, not much longer, like 24 days or something when I went. Um, and it was worth it. I took the time off. My wife let me go because I had small kids at the time. And she let me do it. And it was worth it. I I'll tell you, before I went to the trial lawyers college, I was, and the reason I went to the trial lawyers college was because of Tyrone Mockery. Tyrone suggested to me that I go to the trial lawyers college. Um, but I tell you, before then, I was ready to quit. I was ready to give up the practice of law. I had lost a trial uh, that was hard fought, that we fought against the judge. I had a black client who was accused of assaulting a white, white person, uh, had, had allegedly given the person brain damage. 
and we tried it against a, a judge that was, you know, he was a little different, you know, and uh, and and he he tried the case against us. It was just rough, um, and and the jury was hung for like three days, and the judge kept bringing them back, even though they sent out notes continuously that they were deadlocked, and uh, we objected, but he kept bringing them back, kept bringing them back, kept bringing them back until it went from six to six to nine to three to eleven to one to guilt. And uh, wow, yeah, that's I, the I, that's I, twelve angry I felt men. Like giving up. Was that? That's a twelve angry men scenario. Oh yeah, I felt like giving the, up, man. The, I felt like giving up. Was that? Except the opposite outcome in twelve angry men. Absolutely. That's, uh, so you got revitalized through trial lawyers college. I, I I saw the trial lawyers college. I went there. And, um, and I felt like I was amongst kindred spirits, basically. Other people who felt the way I did, and I got charged, and I uh, started uh, just, you know, back to trying cases. I think when I came back from the trial lawyers college, I had a DNA exoneration, which was like perfect timing. I had a client um, who was exonerated, put me in a newspaper and everything. And so uh, that was in 2006, I think. Um, and, and that was something that really, you know, catapulted my practice. But gave me a lot of confidence. Um, it, it gave me a lot more fight. Uh, I really, my, my confidence was high. And uh, what, what gives you well. what gives you your confidence and and high? Like a lot of us do these things for a lot of other reason. What would you say uh, propels Eric Davis? Man, I want to help people. I want to help people. Um, I, I like to win, of course. I don't like to lose. Where, do, where does your where does your uh, your desire to help people come from, man? Well, you asked me why did I become a lawyer, and I was about to tell you that story, um, but I'll make it quick because I don't know if we have a whole lot of time. But no, well, we got a lot of time, bro. We got a lot of time. Man, when I was a kid, and this is kind of sad in the situation, but you know I've come to grips with it. When I was a kid, I saw my grandmother die in a fluke situation. Um, I, I was I grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana. Grew up in a Lower Ninth Ward. You probably remember Lower Ninth Ward from Katrina. It was a poor neighborhood in, in New Orleans. Um, I, I went went home one day from school, and I saw my parents crying. My mother and father both were crying, and they said that, you know, it's your mama dear, my grandmother. So we rode out to my grandmother's house. She was poor, lived in between these railroad tracks. And one could argue that she lived on the wrong side of the track. So they called the ambulance. She went and had a heart attack. They called the ambulance, and the ambulance went to the wrong side of the tracks, came on the side of the tracks um, that you couldn't get across with a vehicle, and, and they refused to walk to where my grandmother was. But after some coaxing, they got them to walk over to where she was. Um, but by that time, she, she, had, she had died, my relative said. And they said that when they got there, they knew that she wasn't going to make it because as far as they were concerned, because the paramedics were all Caucasian, my grandmother was black, and all my relatives were black and poor. They said, as far as they were concerned, at least the, the, the paramedics, my grandmother could have been a dead dog laying on that floor. And they had no sense of urgency and so forth. So they, they took her, she went to the hospital and was dead. And I remember going to the hospital with my mom and my dad. And my dad uh, was outside um, and, and he went in and I went in and, and my mom was dead. That was one of the first times. My mom never cried. Man. My mom's a comedian, right? She's never, always laughing, always happy, always jovial. But that was the first time, and, and I would almost argue the last time in my life I've ever seen my mom cry. And, uh, and my mom cried. And the whole situation was just just terrible, man. And, and I, I, I resolved. When did, you, I when did you think? I resolved at that point that I was going to try to do something to, to change it. I resolved I was going to try to do something to change it. I was going to try to learn, get skills, do something to change the way the system worked, um, to, to change, the, to, to have some positive impact um, on the world. I thought about becoming a doctor, maybe trying to do something with health care. I thought about being a lawyer, uh, maybe and trying to do something with changing the way things are. Um, people shouldn't be discriminated against. People shouldn't be treated differently. And so I've always strove to try to do something to make the world better. And uh, I don't always see... Really? But I tried. Is that the? It, was that the one of the first times, or that you realized that there is a difference between being white and black? I mean, I have my time 
when I realized that I wasn't white, you know, as crazy as that sounds, it's true, or that I wasn't different, right, or that I was different. Um, do you think it was that moment when you realized that, um, hey, look, if she hadn't have been black, that it, something might have been different, or no? When was your experience that you realized that, that I think I knew look, it before then. I think wait, I knew and before talk then. to me about that. I think, well, I knew it before then. Uh, the first time I saw somebody get shot, I was seven years old. The first time I saw somebody get shot, right? Um, the, the first time I, I, I actually um, saw um, some people treat somebody differently, this is one I remember, where they treated somebody differently and it really mattered a lot to me was then, was with my grandmother. And it, it messed with me. It messed with me for a good while, man. For a good while, but but it helped me in some senses because before she died, um, I'll tell you the truth, man. I wasn't a great student in school. Um, I was I was doing all right, but I wasn't a great student. And after she died, I was committed. Uh, my grades went way up. I got scholarships to a bunch of schools, um, and and so so I think it, it gave me some some drive to do things. But I was still a kid though. I was still a kid. I went to college. I still had fun. I still did all of those things. But but I remember that, that 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 the world was a lot different for me after that. The world was a lot different for me. When did you realize that the world was a lot different for you as a lawyer? Wait, what's that? I missed that last part. I think he's asking you, when did you realize that the world was a lot different for you as a lawyer? Oh man. Every time we go to court. You know, when you deal with prosecutors, you deal with different people, I realize that. I mean, in my right. office, even I realized that well, you know, too. as a black well, man mind. and as a black lawyer, I mean, it's not something that changes. I mean, people treat you differently, you know, and and that's that's always been the situation. I've always experienced that. I've always dealt with it. I mean, I've been stopped when I first moved to Houston, dude. When I first moved to Houston, I got like five tickets within a two month period of time. If I, before then, I had never gotten, besides when I was in high school, I had never gotten a traffic ticket. And then I moved to Houston, and I ended up getting five traffic tickets, speeding tickets, and some of them were situations where I was coming off of the highway, the accelerator, coming off the highway to get stopped and get a ticket. And I remember one time the officer stopped me and stopped a white lady. He let her go and gave me a ticket. And so uh, that's when I discovered David Sprecher. I don't know if any of y'all know David Sprecher. But uh, David yeah. Sprecher and I go way back. We go way back. Because Sprecher used well, to be free for lawyers. And so I went to him, and I decided I was going to fight every ticket. And so I, I went to David Sprecher to fight every ticket. I stopped getting them when Lee Brown made them chart the race of the person who they were stopping. I stopped getting the tickets when they, when they had to write down if I was black or white. But before then, I was getting tickets all the time. You, you practice in Harris County uh, when... Uh, let's say, you know, we say when times were different, uh, maybe they're not so different, right? But when times are different, how do you remember standing up to uh, some of these judges and what made you keep going, knowing that for the last, I mean, up until this last election, you know, there was a systematic oppression for, I mean, it was like, see the people in jail, People in jail deserve to be in jail. Most of the people in jail are brown and black or minority, and that's just how it is, and that's just the that, that's the realm. That's literally how it was for the last, up until maybe a year or two ago, for the last 10 years before that. Um, how, did you fought, how, did you, how did you fight against that, and, and do you remember going up against those things? I, I do. I remember having some, some bad situations, being in some tough situations. I told you about the case where I felt like I wanted to quit. And the reason I wanted to quit, I mean, I wanted to stop being a lawyer, um, was because I, I felt that the system was so rigged and I felt that I was powerless um, to do anything about it. And I'll tell you that story. Um, I was on the courthouse steps crying, basically. Grown man, man. I'm a grown man. Now, before then, I had gotten acquittals in cases. There was some cases. But that one just stuck with me. My client was a single mother, black woman. And I was on the courthouse steps crying, and her family members came up to me and said, what's going on with you, Mr. Davis? I said, I can't do it no more. I just can't do this anymore. And, uh, and I said, I think I'm going to do something different, do something different, is what I told them. And they said, they said, no, Mr. Davis, don't quit. Don't quit, Mr. Davis, because you got heart. We can tell you care. Don't quit. Get better, Mr. Davis. 
Just get better. Don't quit. Get better. They told get me better. that. Get better. That's what they told me. Get better. That's so, kind of like, you know, make you feel like, well, I guess I wasn't good enough. Right? But, right? Yeah. But, but um, the same token. It, that's it, all it, I got to do. It stuck with me, though. It stuck with me, though, Justin. It stuck with me. When they said, don't quit, get better. It stuck with me. And, uh, and, and I, I thought about getting better. So I start, that's, that's how I ended up, you know, seeking out and finding the Trial Lawyers College in part two, you know, trying to find out how to get better, you know, trying to find out how to get better. And, well, you, uh, and you, I, you can teach that. You can't teach heart. You can't teach the experiences that you had growing up and, and teach that to people. But you can take people who have that, like yourself, and then you can learn and, and learn the skills that we need to be better at what we do. And we can help more people. So you're, I think that's awesome that your client's family told you that. Don't quit because you've got heart. Just go get better at it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so let, let, me, let me jump to, and I think I'm black screen on the screen, but let me jump to some of the uh, questions on Facebook Live. I have to just jump back and forth. And I apologize to the viewers. Um, I had some technical difficulties, and so I'm – I'm taking care of what I have to and doing what I have to. But some of them, one of the questions is, we'd like to know if Eric has any ideas how we should implement Harris County Criminal Lawyers Second Chair Program that we're getting back to going. And what's your ideas on may, uh, on being a good mentor and, and uh, having opportunities for mentorships? What's your thoughts on that? You know, it, it's, it's tricky, right? One of the things that I do right now and, and I've always done, is that I think uh, you, you teach by doing um, and, and you lead by example. So I've, I, now that I'm the, the chief of the felony trial division, one of the things that I still do, and people tell me I shouldn't, but I'm going to keep doing it, is that I still handle a docket. I still handle cases. Um, it's not as large as it used to be, um, but I still handle a docket of cases, and I will continue to handle a docket of cases as long as I'm employed at the Harris County Public Defender's Office. If, I, you know, if, if anything, if I do something different than that, um, I'm still going to, if I do something different than being a trial chief, I'm still going to handle a docket of cases uh, because I can't ask somebody to do something I'm not willing to do, first thing. Second, I believe that you learn from doing. And so I try to get lawyers to try cases and work cases with me. Um, so I may have a murder case. Um, for example, Miss, uh, I don't know if any of you know Buki Oyewuwo, all right? Oyewuwo and I tried a murder case, uh, was it late last year, earlier this year? I think it was late last year. And in the end of 2019, we tried the murder case together where Buki did a lot of the trial, and I did a lot of the trial. We tried the case together. We investigated the case together. We prepared the case together. We did mock voir dire together. Even though I was going to do the voir dire, we did a mock voir dire where Buki did a mock voir dire. And after each phase, after each thing that we've done to prepare, we stopped and we talked it all through. When we went to the scene, we go to the scene investigation, we talk it through. I get her ideas, she get my ideas. So I, I think that the, the best way in terms of mentoring is to do things together. Now, some, some people try to mentor by sitting down and just telling people the stuff they need to do. And I, I think that's one way, and that's all fine if that's how you want to do it. You want to sit down and lay out things, but, but I think the best way is to start off doing it and incorporate the person in your doing. In other words, so, so you, you, you sit down, instead of having someone handling a case, and you sit down and outline for them everything they need to do in a handling a case, how about you handle a case together? And then you walk with the person each step of the way in the case. From the beginning, you get a, a, a case in. First thing you do, you, if, you, if your, your situation is you look at the statute or you review the charging documents or you look through the discovery, whatever it is, whoever your secretary is, have them do that with you. Take them step by step in the defense of the case all the way through through trial. And, and that's typically how I try to do it. Um, it's, it's a what is, uh, what, I, I what's do your... That. What's you? What's the thing that Eric Davis likes most? We all love the trial. All of us are trial dogs. You are uh, a, a legendary individual, a mentor and friend, top brass at, H, at the Harris County uh, Public Defender's Office. But what is the part of the trial that uh, Eric Davis loves that, that just 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 can't get enough of? What is it? The part of the trial. Yeah, is it the four dyers, the open, is it the cross? I mean, it's all of it, obviously. But what is it's one? The not guilty. It's the not guilty. That's that's the part everybody loves. But <laughs> yeah. but in, in terms of the actual trials, I, I, I like voir dire. I mean, I like 
cross examination. I like closing argument. I mean, I, what do you I, find I, to be some of the most challenging parts of trying cases? Most challenging part of trying the case is waiting for the verdict. That's the toughest part. But but aside from yeah, that's that, the part you no longer have any control. Exactly. <laughs> the, the part that I think lawyers struggle the most with, that I, I've seen lawyers do the most damage, is voir dire. I think voir dire is the area where lawyers struggle, uh, and lawyers have difficulty with voir dire. Uh, and how, t- talk to us about it. Let me know about it, because I, yeah, mentor me for a second. Why and how? So, so the, the, the issue is, right, that there are a couple of different theories of, of voir dire. I mean, some people's theory of voir dire is to indoctrinate the jury. You want to get in and voir dire, and you want to convince them before they even get out of the box, right? Before they even, I'm sorry, before they even get in the box. You want to convince them to your side. You want to indoctrinate the jury before you get in. Um, and, and I think that there's some problems with that kind of, that, that thinking. Um, I see a lot of lawyers doing that, trying to, trying to get up and give statements and arguments and all of that during voir dire. The issue is if, if a person has held a position or held a, an opinion for 30 years, 40 years, or, or held a disposition for 50 years, you ain't going to change their mind in an hour if you get an hour for voir dire. You're not going to change their mind to change their position, you know? And so, so I think that's a, that's a misconception when people go in trying to indoctrinate jurors. I think the best approach is to try to find out what people think, to find out what people's positions are, and then eliminate mm-hmm. them. So, so I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm a big believer in deselection. Uh, and, and deselection, that, that we find out the people that are hurtful to our cause, hurtful to our clients, and we eliminate those people. And so, so I think that's, and, and the way you do it, um, and the way I've been trained to do it through the trial lawyers college, and I've kind of modified some of the stuff through trial lawyers college that I, I, I use, uh, and that I've learned actually works uh, uh, in, in practice, um, is, is to, to try to eliminate jurors. Uh, and at the same time, if you can, you, you can kind of develop credibility as well with the jury. Um, without the, the need for giving speeches or, or trying to indoctrinate a jury. I think that's the biggest and how, mistake. How are you doing that? Talk, talk, um, I'm gonna, here's me stealing some of your stuff. How, how are you doing that? It, rather than, I, I, I see it because we see lawyers indoctrinating individuals or attempting to, or attempting to, uh, attempt to educate the 30 or 60 that are there. Um, rather than that, you're asking questions or what are you doing? I'm asking questions, trying to engage them and get them in dialogue. I'm trying to get them to talk to me, basically. And so, so there, there are a couple of different ways you do it, right? Um, for example, one, one topic that's really tough for lawyers of why they're on, and, and truth be told, most lawyers don't why they're on it, is race. And in these times, when you think with George Floyd, it might be an issue people might want to why they're on. And maybe not. The fear people have you why they're on a race, you can alienate the jury, they think you're playing a race card. You've voir dire on race, you can eliminate a lot of black jurors, people who might be favorable to your client if you voir dire on race. So people will stay away from it out of fear of, of being seen as playing a race card. But there are ways to do it creatively. And I might voir dire on race like this. And this is what I've done before in the past. You know, um, I might, um, if there's an issue where I have a client who might be Latino or I have a client who's African-American and I have race as an issue in the trial, um, I, I might stop and, and say, a couple of years ago, I was handling the case. Um, where I was defending um, someone um, in a case that involved a white supremacist organization. And I was out in the rural area of, of Harris County, in the rural area, and I did something stupid. I wasn't paying attention, and I ran out of gas. Um, and and I, I ran out of gas from my car, and so it was getting kind of dark. It wasn't dark yet. So I locked up in my car, and, and I started walking, basically. And, you know, being out in the rural area, I wasn't wearing a suit. I was wearing some jeans and a t-shirt, and I had a baseball cap on and some sneakers, and I was walking um, in, in that area. And then the pickup truck came and pulled up and went past me. And it was a high-riding pickup truck that had mud all over it, and it had some stickers and decals in the, in the back window that I didn't really pay much attention to, but I was walking, and as, a, as the truck kind of went by me, it slowed down, and, and my heart started beating. My heart started beating fast as that truck slowed down next to me. And and the window went down on the truck. The old white man stuck his head out the window and said, son, you look like you need some help. You look like you in some trouble. And uh, and I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And then he, he offered me a ride um, down to the gas station, which I thought was real close by, but it ended up being a, about a mile or, or more away. And uh, he rode me down there. He just so happened to have a gas can in the back of his his truck, 
and he let me use his gas can to fill up. Um, and, and I put it back in his truck and we were riding back. And, and he turned to me and he said, he said, you know, son, when I saw you, I thought you were up to no good. And, and I told him, I said, you know, when I saw you, I thought you were up to no good too. <laughs> and, 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 and we both laughed and, and, and he started telling me about himself. And I learned that he was a, a youth pastor. And at that same time, I was working as a youth pastor too. And I learned that he had, had four kids and I have four kids as well. And I learned that we had so much in common. But when I saw him and he saw me, we thought something different about each other. We saw something different uh, about each other. We had feelings about each other just based on how we appear. But I use that. Like the, I tell that story before voir daring on race. And if I got like a, a Latin client on my turn, said, you, you, ladies and gentlemen, you see my client. He's got the, his headphones on. And he, he doesn't look like uh, everybody else in America. He looks like a certain segment of the population in America. He's a Hispanic gentleman. Is there anybody, just by how he appears, how he looks, he feels some kind of way, you know? And then seeing people will talk to him, you know? What, do you, what kind of responses do you get to that? I've gotten some good ones uh, off of that. I've done that, and I've gotten some good ones. I've gotten some people say, yeah, I, I, I kind of feel some kind of way. I've had people say, you know, I want to help him. I kind of feel for him, feel sorry for him, and I want to help him. I want to help. So when you have some people you, say that, when you approach it that way and you say, is anybody kind of feeling something about that? You know, you, yep. you, you approach it real general and broad that way. I approach it real general and broad and then try to narrow it down. How try do to get, the goal is to get people talking. I want right. to get them talking. So once I get them talking and they start talking, then we can kind of have dialogue about it. We can have conversation about it. And so the first person may say, I feel something about it. And I may go to him and say, Miss Jones, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, that you feel something about it. Because that's how I was when I saw that, when I saw that gentleman who ended up being a pastor. When I saw him, I felt some kind of way about it, just based on how he appeared. It's not something that we talk about or that we, we're all proud to admit, but it's how, 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 we, how we feel. And, and this is the no judgment zone. This is, a, this is an opportunity where we get to talk, you know, and then get them talking. And then once they start talking, then we kind of narrow it down and see if we can get cause challenges. It's very difficult to get cause challenges because most people are not going to admit that they're prejudiced um, or that it interferes with them. You know, the, the, the only way I, I think, the only way I've had success doing it in those contexts is by asking questions like, you know, so, so ma'am, you, you're a fair person and you want to be fair and I recognize that. But those feelings we have aren't necessarily the most fairest things that we've ever done, right? Most of right. Is right. And so it doesn't feel good for us. True? True. It says, you know, for our conscience to be clear, our law allows that people can tell us when they think they may not be able to be fair. In a situation where you think you may not be able to be fair, for your conscience to be clear, to not even put yourself in that position. You know, now some people will tell you, I can be fair. And a lot of times, if after they've told me initially that they, they, that they have some feelings and everything, and then they come back and tell me they can be fair, I will most likely, you know, nine out of ten times leave them on a jury. Really? Nine out of ten times. Leave them on a jury. Even because they're giving you that them. commitment to fairness? Absolutely. Think about it, right? That's somebody that's being real with you. That's somebody that's being honest that's enough true. to look at themselves to tell you that. There's a whole bunch of rat bastards who feel that way, ain't gonna say a word. They're not gonna say a that's word, true. they're gonna get on there and try to stick it to your client. But the people and then when they make it back when they make it back in the deliberation room, they might be trying so hard to check that that feeling that they had, that, that, I, can, I can see that. I really like that. I, would you, would you be that amazed, I watched, like, say this would you be amazed the study play. show, the study show just by talking about race. Right. Not, not, not even if you get any call challenges or strike anybody, just by the lawyer talking about race, jurors are more favorable towards a minority or a non-white defendant. Just by the lawyer talking about race. Right. It being mentioned in what it is. That's what the study show. There's a study on it. I have it. Um, if you if you want me to email it to you, just shoot me an email. I'll email you the, the, the information. Um, there was a law review article that incorporated a study that talked about that. Well, don't forget that this is a uh, this is being broadcast not only all around the city of Houston but all around the world. So you may get a few emails asking for that study. That's fine. But, uh, they'll get one from me. So um, I want to. I don't want to ignore what we've been going through over these last week. Um, in across this country and here in Houston. Um, we've got about 15, 13 minutes left. Um, 
man, it's been a really heavy week. Um, with everything that's been going on since the, since George Floyd's killing. Um, I don't even really know where to start. Do you have any thoughts on that? Anything that you... Man, my heart goes out to George Floyd's family. My heart goes out to his family and his friends. It's one thing to have a relative die at the hands of someone else, let alone die at the hands of the police, and let alone have the actual killing broadcast around the world and everyone see it and you yourself be able to see a person die and you do not be able to do nothing about it. Um, so, so my heart goes out to them. They, they have to be in pain. And so that's the first thing. Second thing is, man, this has been happening in America for too long. And like yep. we talked about at the very beginning, right? Um, the system isn't broken. The system is working exactly the way it's supposed to work. In Minneapolis, right? right? Un un unlike other places in Minnesota, just about everywhere in Minnesota, besides Minneapolis, the, the policy of being able to kneel on a suspect's knee to restrain them has been abandoned and has been outlawed in nearly every place in Minnesota except Minneapolis. So the Minneapolis Police Department has this policy that allows an officer to kneel on a suspect's neck or to apply pressure to a suspect's neck to restrain the suspect. And here we have it where we see it on TV being done pursuant to Minnesota Minneapolis policy, um, and, and it results in some charges, right? So, right. so the, the, the thing that seems so obvious is that the policing and the policies are not uniform. So you've got places everywhere else in Minnesota where this, this action has been outlawed, except Minneapolis, and it's allowed to go on and it causes a murder. If there were uniform policing, a uniform policies in regards to use of force, that would not have happened. And George Floyd would not be dead. And many of the cases that we see, many of the cases that we have heard about and, and the heartache that we've had would not have happened if there was uniform policies amongst different police agencies. Picture this. I don't know if you remember the Norman Rockwell photo. You remember the Norman Rockwell photo where Ruby Bridges is being escorted to school? There's yes. A, yes. Norman Rockwell is the painter who paints right, a lot right. of different things. And he he, he with, painted with some civil rights yes. portraits. And so there's yeah. a one where there's a little small black girl in a white dress, and she's been escorted by the four U.S. Marshals. You ever wonder why we had to call in the U.S. Marshals in to, to, to help with segregation when we had local law enforcement? Yeah, they wouldn't they enforce local it. law enforcement. There were local police stations. There were local sheriff's departments. There were city, municipality. There were these municipal police departments, but we had to call them the U.S. Marshals because we couldn't trust the local law enforcement. Right. We couldn't trust the local law enforcement in the South when dealing with people of color. So why are we trusting them now? Why are we trusting them now? They haven't shown anything to say that they're worthy of trust, right? They kill black people routinely and multiple different times, and yet we're still trying to trust them. Yeah. No. When we had so issues, what was that? I agree with it. Well, I don't want to stop that. Keep going. Keep going. We have issues. I, was say, I, I just wonder why why people haven't been pushing for the elimination of most most local law enforcement agencies. Why haven't we pushed for the elimination of most lo local law enforcement? Agencies? I don't know if you ever saw the movie Mississippi Burning. You remember Mississippi yeah. Burning? How it was the police agency. Those police officers actually killed the civil rights workers, and it took the took the uh, took took the the feds to come in and investigate and prosecute them. You know, in, in a U.S. versus ship a long time ago, throughout yeah. the South, local law enforcement have allowed black people to be murdered and killed. You know, right. the black man would be in jail waiting for trial, and a lynch mob would come. The, the sheriff would move aside, let the lynch mob get him. Go get some coffee mob. or whatever, right. It's been happening for, for, for centuries, but yet we've allowed it to occur, right? So we have these local law enforcement agencies that are still in existence. There are some places, for example, when I was in Jacksonville, Florida, there wasn't a, a Jacksonville Police Department. There wasn't a JPD. There was only the sheriff that handled work throughout the whole county. Now, some of that was how the government was set up, but there wasn't a local police station, agency. It was all done by the county and by the sheriff. In some countries, they don't have local law enforcement. They have a nationalized police agency that has national standards that are, that are rigorously, rigorously uh, regimented, and you don't have Jim Bob having his, 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 his nephew working on the law enforcement or on the, on the police department. You don't have all of the nepotism and all of the cronyism. You don't have that going on. But here we've tolerated and put up with, uh, with local law enforcement um, that is rough. With that's exactly what we saw in uh, 
definitely what we saw in the Ahmaud Arbery case, right? One of the, one of the men who was arrested in that is a, an investigator with the district attorney's office. There is zero doubt in my mind that it, that it took three months for that body for that body cam, that video, bizarrely, oddly, coincidentally recorded video. And I think the recorder of that video has been charged now as well. But um, but yeah, that took three months for that to surface. Absolutely had something to do with the fact that local law enforcement, the chief law enforcement officer in that area, the district attorney's and office. And we saw it with George Floyd, right? So, right. so the autopsy report that's put out by the local law enforcement agency that works closely with the Minneapolis Police Department with the coroner there, that that law enforcement comes out and says he doesn't die of asphyxi asphyxiation. And then when they get an independent examination, they say there was evidence of asphyxiation. So how can we trust that? Who's to say that police... We, we have allowed police agencies to police themselves for too long. You got to make an internal affairs complaint to HPD so that HPD officers can investigate other HPD officers? It's ridiculous. We don't do that. No, no, other, no other agency, for the most part, no other profession do that. Um, but we do it, it we, we allow it to be done in local law enforcement. You know, if there weren't cameras, uh, I, I wouldn't say that, because even if there were cameras, if there wasn't as much media attention with George Floyd, those officers wouldn't have been charged. No. If there weren't the protests, the reason they got charged was because of the protests. What would have happened, they first, they wouldn't have gotten fired. They most likely would have gotten suspension with pay. And, and then after a couple of weeks and months go by, um, they, they would get reinstated Back to their job. The, the only reason they got fired, the only reason they got fired was because there were cameras and there was a public outcry. Right. What do you think about Chief Acevedo? There's six. There's been six shootings in the last month. Six deaths. I, Chief Acevedo has been coming out. Um, six police being a champion for people's rights, being a champion for uh, civil rights and all these kind of things. But there's six dead bodies on his watch in the last month, and he's refusing to let out the body cameras. What do you say to that? I mean, it's, it's business as usual, man. That's business as usual. That's typically how things are done and have been done for a long time. Now, you know, you know who has a great record in terms of shooting? Um, and I, I can't give you the stats, but the sheriff's department actually has a pretty good record in terms of citizen shooting. And it could be in part because they're on patrol in the neighborhoods uh, that HPD is. Um, the, the sheriff's department isn't patrolling um, neighborhoods where you have a lot of people of color. They're out in the rural areas and so forth, so they don't really have a have, have the have the same demographics that HPD does. But HPD is patrolling areas where you have people of color, and there are situations where people are getting shot in Houston. And it's just not Houston. It's everywhere in the country. It's everywhere in the country. Now, uh, I would be lying to you if I said that more black people were killed than whites, because the, the facts are that more white people are killed than black people are. Right. More whites are killed than, than are people of color. But um, you have a greater likelihood of being killed if you're unarmed and you're a person of color. Right. Most of the whites who have been killed have been armed. But unarmed people who were killed, the majority of them are black and brown in terms of people who were killed unarmed. So if you're, if you're unarmed and black, there's a greater likelihood you're going to get killed if you're unarmed and white. If you're white and you got a pistol and you have a, a dispute with your wife and you got a gun, it's a great chance you might get killed. And the people who are getting killed uh, who are Caucasian are generally people who have been armed. So, so, so there's still a lot of disproportionality in terms of the killing of black and brown people as opposed to white people. There's still a lot of that that's, that's going on. And, and in terms of the chief, you know, I mean, I, I got to give the chief credit for one thing is that he's trying. Now, some of it may be fueled by political aspirations. Maybe he's trying to run or position himself to run for mayor. Um, but he's at least... Uh, trying to reach out to people. He's at least walking with the protests. He's at least acknowledging that what happened with George Floyd was wrong. And, and I got to give him credit that? for that, at least. And I, I know we have a few where, where, what do you think where, about that? Where these sheriffs and these police all, police chiefs are, you know, praying with protesters. You know, there was the, the sheriff who's been, like, from Michigan or wherever, um, and he took off his baton, and he, he I remember watching that, and he said, let's turn this march into a parade and everyone cheered and i was like wait no don't turn their march into a parade like let them have their damn march if you want to join along sure but don't turn it into a parade but don't what are your out. thoughts eric on on i mean that's, that's law somebody that doesn't understand in these protests i mean i think that's somebody that doesn't understand i'll tell you this right i saw a video um, in new orleans 
and I keep track of what's going on in New Orleans because I'm from New Orleans. So I saw a video in New Orleans where the protesters had blocked I-10. And the police were there uh, to, 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 to confront the protesters. And the police officers took a knee in solidarity with the protesters. It was, it was a powerful moment, man. It was a powerful moment. So, I'd never okay. seen anything like that. But taking a knee, that's a powerful moment. It makes a great image, right? But are they going to go down to the legis? Are they going to send their legislative liaison from that police department to the legislature and say, you know what? We need laws that are stricter and harder on us. Are they going to like really put their money where their mouth is, or is this just for TV? So you know that that's a good point. Now I think it takes a little more than just laws, um, and it takes more than legislation. Obviously, in this situation yeah. with the police, one of the first things I think we've got to do is that we've got to curb the culture uh, in, in police forces. Absolutely. I think we've got to try to change the culture. And, Eric, and Eric, them Dave, me a start Eric Davis, the... <laughs> Eric Davis, the mentor of the year for the Harris County Criminal Lords Association. Eric, we got about two minutes left. Where do we go from here, and how, do you, how are you affecting change as some of the top brass at the, at the Harris County Public Defender's Office? Well, one of the things we've got to do in our office is we've got to get into the community. I, I firmly believe that our lawyers have to get into the community, impact the community. We have to start educating the community and spend time with people in the community. That's the first thing. Second thing is we've got to start filing complaints against police officers, not just people in the PD's office, but people as defense lawyers, large as, as, as a whole. Most of us, I would almost argue every defense lawyer who's practiced has had a client talk about being abused and, and being brutalized by the police. Most of us don't encourage them to file complaints against that police officer. We've got to start doing that. We've got to make it a routine, almost systematic, that we're encouraging our clients to file complaints against abusive police officers. We even got to file complaints against officers who lie. If we got a situation where officers lied in this office report, we got to file a complaint. And not just file them, we got to follow up on them. Start tracking them, following up on what's going on with them and everything else like that. And then start making referrals for people to start filing lawsuits. We've got to try to change or impact culture, the police culture. We cannot tolerate a culture of abuse. And so one of the things that I'm going to be encouraging in the days to come is our lawyers to, to really do a, a good evaluation and try to do that. Eric, um, little words of advice from us that look up to you. Um, you are the this year's uh, Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association Award recipient. I mean, there's, it goes without saying, you're a friend and family uh, down at the courthouse. We got one minute left, a few words of advice and encouragement to everybody that looks up to you. And once again, from the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association, we appreciate you. With last words, what do you say? I want to say thank you first. Uh, thank you for this award. I appreciate it. I'm humbled by it. Um, and then to, to other lawyers, don't, don't stop fighting. Keep fighting. Sometimes you might feel discouraged. You might feel like you're not making a difference. But in the clients that we impact and the people's lives that we come in contact with, you're making a difference. So keep fighting, is what I would say. Keep fighting and be encouraged. Eric Davis, Harris County Criminal Lords Association, Mentor of the Year. I apologize that I have had a, a ton of technical difficulties that I did not want any way, shape, or form to take away from today's award recipient. Uh, Eric Davis, friend, family. Eric, thank you so very much. Justin, why don't you send us home? Congrats, Eric. Thanks very much. Everybody have Thank a good you. night. Hopefully see y'all in a week. Stay safe and stay out there.